Hello everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. I'm your host, Jason Aiken. In this week's episode, Pulp Crazy is continuing the celebration of Robert E. Howard's birth month with a short story not published in Howard's lifetime. It is titled, Marchers of Valhalla. And it's a part of his James Allison series, which are reincarnation tales. Marchers of Valhalla was first published in 1972 by Donald M. Grant. I had the pleasure of reading it in the newest publication from the Robert E. Howard Foundation, titled Swords of the North, which collects Howard's Vikings, and Celtic stories, drafts, and fragments. Marchers of Valhalla was able to be completed thanks to combining multiple drafts by Howard together into one coherent story. I have to say, I've read a decent amount of Robert E. Howard, including all of his Solomon Cain tales, his Call stories, his Dark Agnes tales, and all but the final two Conan stories, as well as a fair amount of his standalone weird fiction. And I would rank Marchers of Valhalla as one of my favorites. Before I get into the story, I would like to thank the members of the Robert E. Howard Forum at Conan.com for their enlightening discussions on Marchers of Valhalla. I don't consider myself to be a Howard scholar, but I am a fan, and I'm always interested in discussions of Howard's work. While reading this story, I peruse two particular threads that I will be including in the show notes. Both have some great additional information, discussion, and scholarship within. If this story sounds up your alley, Check the show notes and hop over to the forums, and check out the threads. Don't be shy about joining up either. It's a great board for discussing Howard, and weird fiction and fantasy in general. Marchers of Valhalla begins with James Allison, sitting on a log along the barren Texas Gulf Coast. The James Allison portion of the tale seems to take place during the time this story was written, which, according to Howard scholar Rusty Burke, was around April 1932, which is the same period where Howard began writing his Conan tales. Rusty states this in the introduction to Swords of the North. James Allison is a very melancholy young man, I'm assuming he is no older than 30, but have nothing to really base that on. He's missing a leg due to a horseback riding accident, which occurred at the age of 14, and he travels with the aid of a crutch. As he sits on the log to take a break, he is visited by a mysterious woman. She appears to recognize James, but calls him by a different name. Heilmar. However, she says he has changed in his appearance. James tells her she must have known him before he lost his leg, but that isn't what the woman means. She tells him the country has memories. James tells her it does, but he has not shared in them. He tells her about his ancestors, who were present at historic events such as the Alamo and the Battle of San Juan Hill. But James has been unable to leave his mark due to his condition, which has left him melancholy. The woman says she remembers him, though, and asks him if he dreams of drowning. This startled James, as indeed he does dream of drowning. He questions her on how she could know this. The woman tells him, while bodies change, the soul remains untouched, the very land they stand upon, 
had memories even more ancient than Egypt. James calls this into question, but she knowingly queries him about the unique geography of Texas. He explains to her that Texas is a succession of broad tablelands, or shelves, that sloped upward from sea level to over 4,000 feet in elevation, like the steps of a gigantic stair. The last break is the Cap Rock, and above that is the Great Plains. The woman reveals that at one time, the Great Plains actually stretched to the Gulf itself. Long ago, the state of Texas was a long upland plateau, which sloped gently to the coast and did not have the breakings and shelvings it had in modern times. She tells him there was a great cataclysm which broke off the land at the Cap Rock. The ocean roared over it, and the Cap Rock became the new shoreline. Then, age by age, the waters receded back from the Cap Rock until the gulf is where it is today. The recession swept into the gulf many ancient things, including the city that once dwelled high above the cliffs. The woman asks James if he can remember the city. She then waves her hands in front of him, and he is transported into a past life as Hylmar, the Acer warrior. And... I usually pronounce that Aesir, but I'm thinking that's pronounced Aser. So I guess for the rest of the episode, I'll pronounce that as Aser, because I think that's more accurate. Now, the Aser are a race in Robert E. Howard's Hyborian Age, which is where his Conan stories take place in. They are the golden haired folk who inhabit the eastern lands of Nordheim. The red-haired Vanir inhabit the western lands of Nordheim. Nordheim is actually split into different lands, each inhabited by their respective race. The lands are called Asgard and Vanaheim, which is a nod to Norse mythology by Howard. Despite the mythological applications to these names, for matters of convenience, I'll just stick with Robert E. Howard's Hyborian Age versions of them. Both of these races, though, are proto-Vikings. To me, it is apparent this story is meant to take place in the Hyborian Age. The inclusion of the Aesir and Vanir races, as well as references made to the Thurian Age of Lemuria and Atlantis, which Robert E. Howard's call inhabited, lend some credence towards this. Not to mention an alternate paragraph referencing Thothamon in a different draft. Thothamon is a sorcerer who appears in The Phoenix on the Sword, the first Conan story. He is often depicted in comics as Conan's arch nemesis, but... He didn't really appear in any other story besides The Phoenix on the Sword, as far as the Robert e, original Robert E. Howard tales go. There is also a Pict in this story included by the name of Gorm, who had joined the band of Aesir warriors in their travels. I believe him to be a Hyborian Age Pict rather than a historical Pict. And I guess I am just too used to saying Aesir, because I've been saying Aesir for the last couple minutes, even though I said I was going to say Aser. So I guess I'm going to keep saying Aesir. Now there is some debate at when exactly this story takes place in the Hyborian Age, or if it takes place in the Hyborian Age at all. Some people believe it takes place post-Hyborian Age. The two threads I mentioned at the start of the podcast on the official Robert E. Howard forums are full of scholarship about this. If you are interested in it, I highly suggest you give them a read. But for the purposes of this review and overview, I'm just going to choose to believe the story takes place in the Hyborian Age, but much later than the Conan tales. 
Well, there's no map in existence of what the Americas looked like during the Hyborian Age. I think this story is the closest thing we are going to get to what REH had in mind for it. Well, at least for his native state of Texas. From what I understand from the Robert E. Howard Forum discussion threads, Howard also included some hints about the Hyborian Age Americas and other stories, and even wrote a letter to a fan about them. Now, in Marches of Valhalla, James Allison narrates the story in the first person, as if he is Hyalmar, the proto-Viking warrior. He provides us some detail as to how the Assyrian warriors arrived in Hyborian Age Texas, but not much. From what I gather, it was done completely by trekking, with no sailing involved. It appears they trekked south from Nordheim, then traveled east across Hyboria, and then northeast, where they then crossed over the frozen sea into the Hyborian Age Americas. From Hyomar's description of the trek, it must have been a long one. He says he started out as a boy, but when the story begins, he is currently a man. The band of warriors is currently in Hyborian Age, Texas, where they are preparing to attack a city on the Gulf Coast. This ancient city's name is Kemu. The leader of their group was an aged warrior named Bragi. Although it's never explicitly stated, I kind of got the impression Hyomar was a second-in-command of sorts to Bragi. What follows is a tale in true Robert E. Howard Blood and Thunder fashion. His proto-Vikings are some violent dudes, but they are also some very skilled warriors. The inhabitants of Kemu were dark-skinned, but they were neither black nor brown people. They did have hawk-like features. Later in the story, they claimed descent from Lemurians. These Kemu warriors charged the Esir and paid dearly for it, getting slaughtered by the powerful proto-Vikings in the process. After defeating the first wave of the city's warriors, the Asir reach an agreement with the city leaders to protect Kemu from scores of black warriors who were led by a giant veneer. The huge red-haired warrior somehow made his way into the islands of the blacks and crowned himself their king. The veneer has united the different black tribes, and he has his eyes on conquering Kemu. It's never stated, but I'm thinking the blacks in this story may be proto-Haitians or proto-Jamaicans, uh, just given the location. Apart from the action scenes, the story also has some political intrigue, in the form of the city leaders slash priests who rule over the people. There is also a woman who Hyomar takes a fancy to, named Aluna. She's also a displaced Asir, and is handmaiden to the goddess of the Kemu people, Ishtar. She adds some romantic undertones to the tale. However, I have to point out that the Asir are not a romantic people. They are violent, conquering warriors who have no problem forcefully taking whatever or whoever they want. The story basically deals with the Esir living within and near Kemu, while awaiting their chance to defend the city and engage in battle with the Veneer and his black army. All the while they are left wondering if they can truly trust the citizens of Kemu. As I mentioned before, Marchers of Valhalla is a coherent linear narrative, despite being made up of multiple drafts. However, since it is made up of a combination of drafts, it isn't as polished as Howard's completed tales. But the same could be said for the draft work of any other author. Personally, I find myself feeling very lucky 
to having read this story at all, uh, no matter what version it is. This is a really good story, and it was a lot of fun to read. I enjoyed it just as much as Howard's Conan Tales. I'm a real sucker for REH battle scenes, and Marchers of Valhalla didn't disappoint in the least. I really don't believe there is another author that walked the earth who writes action scenes better than Robert E. Howard. The Del Rey Robert E. Howard paperbacks did a great job in getting Howard back into print with the preferred text of his work. I was always hoping for them to publish a book dedicated to his reincarnation stories, but that never happened. Swords of the North from the Robert E. Howard Foundation is the closest thing we are going to get to the preferred texts of these stories. Well, I shouldn't even say that. This is it. Um, it's not the closest we are going to get. It is it. Um, you get those stories in here, and for a bonus, um, there's incomplete fragments that I understand are very hard to track down. And additionally, there are also Viking and Celtic tales included, in addition to the reincarnation stories. In a way, this was kind of the missing book I was looking forward to from the Del Rey series. So I was really glad to see the Robert E. Howard Foundation bring this out. In a way, I feel like my Del Rey collection is complete. If you purchased all the Del Rey collections and you haven't pulled the trigger and ordered a Robert E. Howard Foundation book, I would recommend this one. Swords of the North started out with a print run of 200 copies, but it has proved to be so popular the Robert E. Howard Foundation have run off an additional 50 copies to meet the demand. So head to the Robert E. Howard Foundation website to check out the table of contents and other details about the book to see if it's something you might be interested in purchasing. It will only be available for a limited time due to the print run, and it's liable to sell out really at any time. I'll put a link in the show notes to the book's page, as well as to two discussion threads about Marchers of Valhalla on the Robert E. Howard forums. I'll also include a link to a Hyborian Age map, so you can see where Nordheim is located in the Hyborian Age. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Pulp Crazy is located at pulpcrazy.com. I'm at pulpcrazy on Twitter and facebook.com slash pulpcrazy. My YouTube channel is located at youtube.com slash pulpcast. You can also email me at pulpcrazy at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.